Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining in spirit tonight for our lung health webinar entitled Every Breath You Take. I'm Michelle Marshall, the Assistant Vice President for Oncology Services, and I will be your moderator for tonight's presentation. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. First of all, just to note that this presentation is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Now, regarding our virtual format, you may already know this, but we cannot see or hear you. The only audio and video that's turned on right now is for our presenters and our panelists. That being said, we wanna make this interactive and we encourage you to participate by asking questions. On your screen, you'll see a box at the bottom labeled Q&A. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation and we'll address as many of those as possible at the end. Your questions will only be visible to the panelists. And if you'd like to keep your identity anonymous, just select the box that says anonymous before you hit submit on your question. Throughout the presentation, you'll also see poll questions pop up on your screen. All of the questions will be multiple choice or true or false, and we encourage you to participate. That's what makes it fun. Finally, you'll receive an email after the, tonight's event with a recording, so you can check back in uh, and reference this in the future. So with those details out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. The purpose of tonight's program is to provide you with an overview of lung cancer risk factors, screening procedures, and what Inspira can offer you should you be diagnosed with lung cancer. You can see the specific topics that we'll cover here on the slide. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Charles Shea. Dr. Shea is a board certified thoracic surgeon and the medical director of the Lung Cancer Program at Inspira. Joining Inspira is a return to the Northeast for him. He received his medical degree from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He completed his general surgery residency at Lankanau Medical Center in Wynwood, PA and his fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery at Yale New Haven Hospital in Connecticut. Most recently, Dr. Shea was an attending surgeon affiliated with the Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Shea has a particular interest in increasing lung cancer cure rates through enhanced access to screening and image-guided diagnostic procedures. He specializes in minimally invasive procedures for lung cancer, and we're thrilled to have him as part of our lung cancer team. Dr. Shea, you want to say hello? Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to, um, to see my talk tonight. So before I turn it over to Dr. Shea, I'd like to lead off with a few statistics. According to the American Cancer Society, lung cancer is the second most common cancer in the U.S. There are about 230,000 cases diagnosed each year which is, accounts for approximately 14% of the total lung cancer cases. In New Jersey, there are more than 6,000 cases that are diagnosed every year. The incidence rate in our region, specifically Cumberland, Salem, and Gloucester counties, is nearly double that of the state average. So lung cancer is a very real problem for our community, and Inspira is committed to not only treating patients who have been diagnosed with lung cancer, but to empowering our friends and neighbors with the tools for prevention and, and early detection, bringing technology and programs to the community to diagnose lung cancer when it's most treatable. So let's start our presentation tonight with a poll question. Everyone knows there's a link between lung cancer and smoking, but lung cancer can impact non-smokers as well. So here's the question, what percentage of total lung cancer cases are found in people who have never smoked? 10%, 25%, 50% or 80%? I'll give you just a couple seconds here to place your votes. All right, we're gonna close that and let's see what the response was. It looks like about half of us are saying 10%, 30% or so say 25%, a couple say 50%. Dr. Shea, why don't I turn it over to you? Let, let us know how, if people are right. Thank you, Michelle. And um, 
first like to thank everyone to uh, take the time to tune in to this webinar on this uh, in this evening on your lung health. And um, I think that by this time, just about everyone um, in, in this world knows that cigarettes are the main cause of lung cancer. Um, but really, did you know that anyone can get lung cancer? Back to the poll question. Um, you guys are actually pretty darn good. Now, while close to 90% of lung cancer cases is uh, attributed to smoking, about 10%, as you guys guessed, uh, many of you guessed, 10 to 15% of new lung cancer cases are actually among never smokers, people who never um, you know, smoked a single cigarette in their life. Um, and the reason that for that is that there are environmental factors, um, things such as like in this area of New Jersey, glass factories, <clears throat> agriculture. It's been found that in occupations such as glass making, the, just the inhalation of uh, this uh, substance in, the, in, in this dust, it's called a silica dust, has been found to, be, to lead to a condition in the lung called silicosis, where this dust particles settle in the lung and scar the lung. And when that happens, it affects the ability of the lung to function properly, to exchange oxygen. And just this condition, the deposit of uh, these um, silica dust in the lungs, silicosis, in, in of itself has been linked to, um, to lung cancer. There are other, uh, also other environmental factors. Um, many of the us know about these uh, radon detectors in, in houses, uh, especially in the, base, um, in the basements, for example. Radon is, is basically an odorless gas that occurs naturally in soil and rock. And we have these, uh, many of us have radon detectors because radon gas itself has been linked to lung cancer. As a matter of fact, it accounts for almost 10% of lung cancer cases. And for basically in many of those patients, people who never smoked and come down with lung cancer. Um, now I didn't know about this actually, uh, the exposure in, uh, before, but the exposure to radon has been estimated to be the second leading cause of lung cancer. It accounts for almost 21,000 American uh, lung cancer deaths each year. Uh, I, I moved up from uh, from the Atlanta, from Georgia area, and we didn't have a basement. But uh, when my family we moved up here, uh, we got one of those um, radon detectors and uh, stuck it in the basement. And the house is actually fairly new, two or three years old. But <clears throat> we were we were really shocked at how high the uh, radon levels uh, could be. So typically, you want it below. Four, you know, kind of like the magic number, if you will. Um, it was in, it was around five, six, and after a, after rain, it could be up to ten. So, uh, in our case, we actually um, hired a um, an, an inspector to look at it, and uh, actually had them uh, put in one instead of a so-called passive um, system to get rid of the radon gas. Uh, going into the basement, we actually have uh, the technicians install a fan um, so that it would blow up the radon gas. And our radon detectors are now showing us, you know, far less, like 0.5 versus 5, 6, or even 10. So anyway, it's just one of those things that, um, you know, especially in this part of the state, part of the country, um, it's actually, and it depends on where you live, of course. It can be um, actually a significant um, uh, cause for concern. Anyway, other things, family history. Family history itself is also important. They have done uh, epidemiological studies looking at family trees and found that genetic disposition plays a quite important role in people with an immediate family member, basically a father and mother, a son, uh, in, <clears throat> or a sister or brother, uh, those people have a uh, history with an immediate family member with a history of lung cancer. They have a two to three fold increase in risk of developing lung cancer.
so versus someone who doesn't have an immediate uh, family member. And finally, let's talk about the role of smoking in lung cancer. Um, and so how does cigarette smoking lead to lung cancer? Basically, smoke is full of cancer-causing substances called carcinogens. Uh, we have all heard of things like tar and other things like formaldehyde. Basically, these things cause our DNA in our cells. They cause DNA damage in our cells, especially in the lung. Now, the body is amazing. It's able to repair this 99.99% um, <clears throat> of the time. But with repeat exposure, basically, years of smoking, et cetera, um, you know, that 0.001%, uh, that's not repaired, along with the inflammation that results from this repeat exposure to uh, cigarette smoke. It causes eventually mutations or changes in our DNA that develop that can that may ultimately uh, lead to um, lung cancer. Oops, excuse me. Um, sorry about the switching the slides. I'm kind of having a little bit of technical issues. Well, anyway, and the statistics are sobering. One in sixteen people in the United States. Um, will be diagnosed with lung cancer sometime in their lifetime. And more than 228,000 people in the U.S. will be diagnosed with lung cancer this year alone. Uh, that equates to about a new, diagno new diagnosis of lung cancer every, every uh, two and a half minutes, roughly. That's really uh, quite some statistics. So let's do a quick poll question for the, the audience on some of these stats. We learned that lung cancer accounts for about 14% of total cancers, but what percentage of all cancer deaths are attributable to lung cancer? You see your options here on the screen. Is it 10%, 25%, 40%, or 75%? What do you think? You did pretty well with the first one. We'll see if you get this one right too. Just take a minute here. All right, let's take a look at those results. Looks like the majority of the audience is saying about 25%. So Dr. Shea, are they continuing on their track? Are they getting it right? Pretty darn good, pretty darn good. Um, so lung cancer, really, it punches very well above its weight in terms of causing death. While lung cancer nowadays accounts for only about 13% of all new cancer diagnosis, basically the incidence of only 13% of all cancers in this country. However, it is the cause of uh, uh, lung cancer death in almost 25%. So only 13% of, of new cancer diagnosis, yet 25% of all cancer death are from lung cancer, so almost twice. It is, of course, it is the lung, uh, leading cause of lung cancer death, of cancer death, excuse me, regardless of gender or ethnicity, and takes about 154,000 American lives every year. In fact, there are more lives lost to lung cancer than to colorectal, breast, and prostate cancers combined. And even today, only about 21% of all people diagnosed with lung cancer will survive uh, five years or more. But if it's caught, caught before it spreads, the chance for five-year survival improves dramatically. And we'll get to that at a later uh, slide. Those stats are really sobering and, and pretty staggering. But I did hear some good news in, in all of that. And that is that many of the risk factors for lung cancer are controllable, which is encouraging because it allows people to take action for their own health. And cancer screenings are another way that people can be proactive in managing their health. Until just a few years ago, there really hadn't been a good test for, or screening test rather, for lung cancer. But that changed about six years ago when the US Preventive Task Force 
recognized low-dose CT screening for lung cancer as an essential service. And that really opened the door for insurance coverage of the test, and it allows high-risk individuals to access a potentially life-saving technology. Early detection in lung cancer, as you just mentioned, is particularly important as your survival odds change dramatically depending on if cancer is caught early. So Dr. Say, can you tell us a little bit more about lung cancer screening and how it's been such a game changer in terms of the treatment um, and early detection of lung cancer? Yes, absolutely. The, the statistics of uh, lung cancer survival is uh, really quite remarkable. Uh, those who are found early, uh, I'm talking about those in the very early stages of lung cancer, stage one, um, um, have a up to 80% uh, survival at five years after diagnosis. While those who are in the late stages of lung cancer, for example, stage four, the survival is in the low single digits around 5%. So 80%, 5%, you know, very, Few things are that uh, dramatic and, and black and white. It's, it's one of those things that um, that is really that dramatic. But unfortunately, even um, in this day and age, with really all the new treatments that are available, still the majority of people with lung cancer are found in the later stages, and which I just uh, we just discussed. The prognosis is just um, very poor. So therefore, um, this, this justifies that, that we need to get better at finding and treating lung cancer in its early stages. And one way to do that is through lung cancer screening with uh, CT or CAT scans. There was a, a study uh, a few years ago, but relatively recent, of over 50,000 people in the United States and, that we, and they found that CAT, uh, CT screen, CAT screen uh, for lung cancer improved survival. And it improved survival um, in, in people because of the detection of uh, lung cancer in the very early stages, especially stage one lung cancer. So you may ask, what are the criteria for lung cancer screening? The eligible eligibility criteria right now are people between the ages of 55 to 77. They should not have any signs um, or symptoms of lung cancer, no coughing, uh, shortness of breath, coughing of blood, for example. Um, they need to have a uh, tobacco smoking uh, history of at least 30 pack years. So if you say smoke one pack um, uh, per day for 30 years, that's 30 pack years. Or say if you smoke two packs a day for 15 years, 15 times two, that's um, what's called 30 pack years. And uh, you need to be either a current smoker or if you have quit smoking, you must have quit smoking within the last 15 years. That's really a remarkable technology that allows patients to be much more proactive in monitoring their health. And I should note that Inspira is able to provide low-dose CTs at seven imaging locations throughout our community. So we've really committed to ensuring access to this screening for the residents of South Jersey. But screening isn't the only way that we find lung cancer or lung problems. And Sometimes even when patients don't have any symptoms, we might find possible areas of concern incidentally as part of another imaging study. So Dr. Shea, can you tell us about these types of findings that are often referred to as incidental lung nodules? Absolutely. Um, we often hear about so-called spots on the lung or lung nodules. So what are they? Basically, they are a small single mass in the lungs. Um, they're very common and, and the vast majority are benign, meaning they're not cancer. Um, these spots on the lung are very often found when, you know, when imaging is test for another purpose. For example, uh, say, you know, you go down to the um, 
to urgent care or your family physician and you say, doc, I've been, you know, based having, for example, a cough uh, for some time. And sometimes they're often in a uh, chest X-ray or a CAT scan could be performed and they find a spot on the lung. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have lung cancer, but um, it could be for basically imaging for another purpose. As a matter of fact, they have found that uh, for people uh, by age 50, almost 50% 50 of people have these so-called spots or uh, nodules in their lung. And luckily, 95% of those nodules are not cancer. In fact, these so-called incidental nodules are found in one out of every 500 chest x-rays that uh, people do, uh, ERs, in family doctor's uh, offices, for example. And basically, these lung spots are seen when people have these x-rays for some other reason. And so because the large majority of lung nodules are not cancer, we obviously do not want to subject people to unnecessary tests, uh, further tests and procedures. But at the same time, we cannot let things just fall through the cracks and miss lung cancers. So doctors look at particular characteristics of these lung nodules that make it more likely that it is um, lung can to be lung cancer. And what is the size of the nodule? Or, um, and in general, the larger it is, the more likely it may be cancer. Another criteria is the type of nodule, such as the borders of it. Um, there are nodules with smooth borders and others with irregularly jagged borders, what uh, we medicine call speculated. And those speculated ones are, tend to be the more worrisome and will often uh, warrant uh, more further investigation. Another is, is the nodule solid or is it more liquid-like? In general, the more solid it is, the more likely that it is cancer. And also, are those nodules single by themselves or many nodules? And finally, um, are these nodules in a low-risk uh, person, such as a young patient in their 20s, for example, with no smoking history, or is it someone who has smoked for many years, uh, uh, as in, you know, and older as in, a, in this case, a higher risk patient. And for those nodules where the risk is you know, in, in between intermediate, then doctors may often uh, watch it or what we call surveillance. At Inspiro, we have a lung nodule clinic where we closely monitor, watch these nodules in terms of any changes in the size or the characteristics, as we talked about, if it becomes more irregular or not. These nodules can also be uh, followed by your uh, family physician or primary care physician, pulmonologist or lung doctor, or a thoracic surgeon. So screening for the incidental nodules are typically found when patients are presenting with no symptoms. But sometimes patients do have symptoms. Can you give us just a brief overview of some of the signs and symptoms that should not be ignored? Absolutely. The most common signs and symptoms of lung cancer, and especially in the later stage of lung cancers, include coughing symptoms. And we're not talking about a cough that, that you have and goes away after a day or two. We're talking about persistent, ongoing, or cough that gets, has gotten worse over time. Um, coughing up blood, for example, and, you, know, you know, sometimes we may cough up you know, a couple of specks of blood when we, when we have a big uh, coughing fit, but we're talking about ongoing as well. Other symptoms uh, include shortness of breath, especially uh, shortness of breath that has worsened over time, new wheezing when you breathe, or aching or pain in the chest, upper back, or, um, and that doesn't go away or may get worse, especially when you take a deep breath. 
other uh, symptoms are more general, like unexplained weight loss. You're not trying to lose weight, but the weight just seems to go, uh, just seems to go down. If you have trouble swallowing or fatigue and uh, with no known cause, not like you had a long day at work, but just fatigue, you're tired for even though you may have slept all, all night long. And the unfortunate thing unfortunate, with these symptoms that I mentioned is that they're what's called nonspecific. These symptoms are also symptoms that many other diseases uh, and everyday illnesses also have. And these, and not necessarily lung cancer. So it's important to talk to your doctor if you have these symptoms, especially if you're currently smoking or have had a history of smoking. So what happens if you find a nodule, either incidentally through screening or through a diagnostic due to symptoms and it's suspicious? What are the next steps? Can you tell us a little bit about the advanced diagnostics that now allow our physicians to monitor and test these smaller nodules and help us to catch cancer earlier when it's more treatable? Yes, absolutely. And Spira, we offer advanced techniques that allow us to diagnose problems very often without even needing to make any, any incisions, any surgical cuts on the skin. For example, um, and in Spira, we offer advanced bronchoscopy. This is basically a minimally invas invasive procedure where a camera is inserted through the mouth while the patient is, um, is asleep, basically. And this allows uh, physicians to look down into the airways through the camera attached to a small tube that's inserted and, and allows us to go into the lungs and look for any I'm going to uh, put them on my laser pointer. Um, the lesion, this cancer, suspected cancer is right here. So this camera goes through the mouth and can visual, potentially visualize this cancer right there. And at the same time, be able to take a biopsy or, or a, a tissue and send it to the lab. There are also other uh, techniques of um, adding spill that we offer was called endobronchial ultrasound or EBUS, e EBUS for short. This is basically a variation of the bronchoscopy that I just mentioned earlier. And this uses ultrasound guidance during the bronchoscopy, during the uh, camera procedure. And that allows your doctor to visualize structures within the, within the airway, within the trach windpipe, for example in the lung, in the, in, the, in the chest called the mediastinum. Let me see, let me show you here. So this is the end of the probe right here. Uh, this is the uh, bronchoscope. And end of it, instead of just a light, it has this ultrasound probe. So it allows the doctor to be able to see in, in real time exactly where he or she is going. And the probe, right, the ultrasound probe is placed right at the edge of the, uh, of the airway and assesses the, for example, nearby uh, lymph nodes. And the end of it also is uh, supplied with a um, biopsy needle. So the doctor can place a probe right, for example, in this area, get an ultrasound of it. And if there's a suspicious um, uh, lymph node, for example, then a needle is inserted and you can kind of see, see this whitish uh, tinge um, in the middle of this ultrasound. That's, the, that's where a needle and it is taking a piece of that, uh, a biopsy of that lymph node. There is um, another uh, advanced diagnostic uh, tool that's offered at Inspira called electromagnetic navigation of bronchoscopy. And here, this tool uses uh, electromagnetic technology to find where the lung lesion is, where the lung cancer is. And it uh, directs tools to, be, uh, to allow the doctor to get to the uh, lesion also in real time. What happens is that the patient gets a uh, CAT scan prior to the procedure. And this information is fed to a uh, specialized computer that generates a three-dimensional, a 3D map of the entire lung and the airways. 
the computer then actually literally ca calculates a, a pathway, a virtual pathway um, through, the, uh, through the chest to this lesion, basically roadmap. And then, then all the doctor needs to do is follow that pathway, very much like how a GPS direct a driver where to go. Now I'll show you the next slide here. Basically, this computer generates this uh, using the CAT scan prior to, and this computer generates the green dot right here is where the lung cancer is. And the computer says, okay, you want to go down here, you want to go down this uh, pathway, and then you want to go up here to get to this uh, lung nodule. So all the dots needs to do is place the camera down, follow this pathway, and then is and then get right right on the spot without any incisions, without any cuts on the patient's skin. It's really amazing how technology continues to evolve, allowing us more and more insight into identifying and treating disease. And while these diagnostic procedures may reveal benign results, Sometimes they will detect cancer. And should you find yourself ever hearing those words, the good news is that we're here for you with technology and treatment options and a dedicated team of healthcare providers. We call it a multidisciplinary team who work together to create a customized treatment plan that's really tailored to you and, and your cancer needs. So our team of physicians meets regularly in what we call a tumor board where they discuss the clinical details of our new cancer cases, and then they work collaboratively to determine what's the most appropriate treatment plan. And that team includes not only our highly trained physicians, our surgeons like Dr. Shea and medical and radiation oncologists and radiologists and pathologists, but <coughs> nurses, <coughs> excuse me, nurses, navigators, social workers, nutrition specialists, who are all here to support our cancer patients every step of the way. So Dr. Shea is actually gonna walk us through each of these treatment options in a little bit more detail. And it's important to note that your physician will determine which treatment or combination of treatments is right for you based on the nature of your cancer. But Dr. Shea, do you wanna start us off by talking through some of the surgical options that are most common for our lung cancer patients? Yes. So for anyone with a diagnosis of lung cancer, you must, of course, first talk with your doctor about what the stage of the cancer is and which options are available. For those who are eligible for surgery, surgery consists of basically two main approaches, if you will. Um, one is a traditional open door economy, where in, in this uh, cartoon here, uh, the side of the chest, where an incision is made uh, between the ribs and then a um, instrument is placed between the ribs to spread the ribs out. Another uh, main technique is minimal, so-called minimally invasive using either video assisted with a camera or robotic assisted uh, using uh, robotic uh, instruments that assist the surgeon in terms of doing surgery. Here's a schematic of the most commonly done lung cancer surgeries. The lung um, actually consists of several parts on each side called lobes, L-O-B-E-S. You can think of the lobes of the lung as kind of peels of an orange. Now they are, you know, they are, they sit together, but they are actually separate pieces that can be peeled apart. For example, on the right side, um, of the lung, there are three lobes. There is the upper part, the upper lobe. There is a middle lobe, I can outline it right here, and there is the lower lobe. Um, it's only partially in the front, but most of it's in the back. And on the left side, there are two, uh, two main parts, the upper lobe and the lower lobe. It is not shown very well, but you can kind of see the border right here. And in terms of surgeries, um, done for cancer. Here's a schematic of a uh, lung cancer at the edge of, of the lung right here on the side. And in, in a procedure called a wedge resection, uh, we are taking a, like a wedge of, 
a small piece of the tissue encompassing the cancer, but also involving it, um, make, making sure the borders, the margins, if you will, of the, of the resection are clean, of, are clear of cancer. Now for patients who have larger uh, cancers, if in this example, where the yellow uh, indicates lung cancer, or if they're close to the middle of the chest, then a procedure called a lobectomy, removing the entire lobe, is done. In this case, obviously, we cannot take a small wedge at the ed edge of the lung. In this case, we'll need to take the entire lobe. And when that's removed, this is how, how that looks like. So the main approaches to cutting lung cancer, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, is called, one is called open thoracotomy, where um, there a, a relatively larger incision is made between the ribs and a rib spreader is put, instruments put in there and spreads the rib apart. And minimally invasive, in this case, video assisted thoracoscopic surgery vats, where a camera is placed and then using specialized instruments here and here, and using only quarter inch incisions, um, the camera is placed and the instruments are used to uh, dissect out and remove the lung cancer. And here in Spira, we offer advanced techniques for removal of lung cancers with the minimal invasive approach. Basically, we make tiny quarter inch incisions, for example, right here with a camera, quarter inch, quarter inch, quarter inch. And through these tiny incisions, we use these very long instruments and using a camera to guide uh, with the basic bone up on a uh, uh, um, high definition uh, screen to cut out the cancer instead of having to use a uh, large incision. And this technique using the small incisions has proven time and time again to offer much better patient experience in terms of pain control, amount of times having to be spent at a hospital and much shorter recovery time after going home. In this case, we're using these particular instruments to cut out uh, the lung cancer with the dotted line right here. And many of you have also heard robotic assisted is basically another variation of the minimal invasive technique. And other than surgery, and of course, depending on the stage of the lung cancer, there are also other treatment methods that are used such as radiation to kill the cancer cells. At Inspira, multiple modes of radiation therapy are used. In what's called external beam radiation therapy, or uh, EBRT, the radiation is what's called dose fractionated, where the total amount of radiation is given over a period of many days spread out. There's also another modality used here in what's called stereotactic radiation um, body therapy. It's a technique which administers the photos of radiation in one or very small number of treatment fractions. Now, each of these uh, modalities is indicated for different conditions. So ask your doctor about these op options. This truly is, a, is an exciting time for lung cancer treatment. We're hearing about new developments for the treatment of lung cancer all the time. And especially in this era, in the area of immunotherapy. Many of you have heard of some of these brand names on TV commercials like Keytruda, like Optivo. So what is the difference between chemotherapy or chemo and immunotherapy? Chemo is a treatment with drugs that kills rapidly dividing cells in the body, such as cancer cells. Cancer cells are essentially cells on steroids. They divide like crazy. And chemo basically uh, kills these very rapidly dividing cells. Immunotherapy is a treatment that works to enhance the body's, works with the body to enhance the body's natural immune system to recognize, target, and eliminate cancer cells. 
So immunotherapy works with the body and then using the body's own um, already made immune system to detect and kill the cancer cells. The paradigm has changed really so much and even the last few years. For example, some lung cancer that used to be treated with chemotherapy up front are now being treated with immunotherapy instead. And spare, once a biopsy is obtained, there will be thorough tests conducted on the tissue to see if these uh, new treatments can be used. Some of these uh, tests include biomarker testing to see if the patient will be a candidate for any of the new treatments um, available, like immunotherapy. And Inspira has been closely involved with the most up-to-date and innovative approaches to patients' cancer care. And there are several active clinical trials involving lung cancer that are ongoing at our leading edge cancer center and working collaboration with cancer doctors or oncologists, we will work to ensure that your cancer care is at the forefront of cutting edge therapy. Well, there are definitely a lot of factors to consider in creating a treatment plan for lung cancer patients. Thank you very much for outlining those options for us. I think it's encouraging to know that these services are available to our patients locally, where they can be close to their family and their support network, as we know how important this type of support really is for patients who are on a cancer journey. So let's shift gears just a little bit and touch on a topic that is certainly top of mind for all of us these days, and that's COVID-19. Uh, before we do that though, just a quick poll question. I'd like, a, like to see what your thoughts are here. If I have an underlying lung issue, like COPD or lung cancer, I am more likely to contract COVID-19. Do you think that's true or false? Take a moment here to record your answer. All right, looks like the poll has closed. Let's see the results. Oh, and we are just about split 50-50. Very interesting. So I will let Dr. Shea uh, talk a little bit about COVID-19 and, and lung health. Were they right? You know, um, the short answer is false. You are not likely to catch COVID-19 if you have underlying lung disease. But having said that, well, there does not appear to be higher risk of catching a virus with underlying medical conditions. However, there does appear to be higher risk for complications if you were to get COVID-19. And in terms of how to protect yourself, many of us have heard just from the news uh, on daily, stay at home um, if possible, wash your hands off and clean and disinfect surfaces, social distancing, six feet being the um, the minimum, um, if you will, then the exposure to people who are sick. When you cough and sneeze, do that into your elbow. And then again, and again, especially uh, with the winter coming in, wear a face mask while in public. So while you can take action to keep yourself safe from COVID-19, you can also take action for your lung health overall and take steps to reduce your risk of developing lung cancer. Can you talk to us about some practical things that we can do to reduce our risk? Yep, just alluded to all those things that um, uh, we can do. Uh, you know, very many of us have um, heard about this over and over again. And you know, take action for your lung health. Always maintain a healthy diet and healthy weight. You want to make sure uh, as much as you can to, reg to exercise regularly. Um, those radon test uh, uh, detectors can actually come in handy. They may be a little pricey at times, but um, I, for example, uh, I was quite surprised when I put a, a uh, radon detector in my basement and found just how, how high uh, the levels can be. Be aware of your environment and avoid uh, carcinogens. Avoid secondhand smoke. Uh, whenever others are smoking, 
stay away from that. Or if someone in the family smokes, ask them to, for example, go outside. And of course, don't smoke. If you have never smoked, obviously don't start. And if you do smoke, quit now. If quitting smoking really is the number one best thing you can do for your lung health. So let's talk about smoking for a minute. I think it's a, a good place for another poll question. Here's my question for you, audience. When you stop smoking, how long does it take for your body to begin to heal itself? 20 minutes, two hours, 24 hours, or one week? Take a minute there to record your responses. All right, let's see what you think. So the majority are saying 24 hours to one week. I'm actually gonna spill the beans on this one and say it's actually 20 minutes. The body is an absolutely amazing thing. So Dr. Shea, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the amazing things that start to happen even as soon as 20 minutes after someone stops smoking? It really is amazing. Even just 20 minutes, your body starts um, um, to basically try to heal itself. After 20 minutes, your heart rate, your blood pressure drop back to normal levels. These, these can be dramatic even in a, few, in, in, the, in a few minutes. After eight hours, the levels of nicotine and carbon monoxide in your, in your blood are reduced by more than half. And your oxygen level um, in your blood returns to normal, where it, where it should be. After 12 hours, the level of carbon monoxide from the, from the cigarettes in your body returns to normal, meaning that your heart won't have to pump as hard to get oxygen to the rest of your body. And after three days, your breathing will be easier. You may experience growth in your lung capacity, meaning that your, um, your lungs is able to be able to help you breathe um, better, exchange oxygen better, and your body will be 100% free of nicotine after three days. When you stop smoking after one week, it, it really is the time to pat yourself on the back because people who make it to one week after uh, of quitting smoking, they are at nine times as likely to successfully quit smoking for good. After two weeks, there's improved circulation of blood in your body. Your lung function may increase versus when you were smoking. And after a month, there's gonna be less coughing, less strenuous breath as your lungs continue on their healing journey. It may take up to 30 attempts at quitting smoking for a smoker to quit. Don't give up, it, it will come at some point. I think that last message there is so powerful and, you know, it, it can take up to 30 attempts. So whether you're on attempt number one, number nine, or number 29, we do have resources to help you because there has been a lot of scientific study around this and cold turkey does not work for everyone. So I'm very happy to share this information with you about Inspira's Quit Center, which is a program that is completely free to residents of our community. It includes nicotine replacement therapy for patients who find that that is a, an aid to them. Um, and our program has actually gone completely virtual with response to COVID-19. So we offer both one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions as well as the development of a comprehensive individualized quit plan and group counseling sessions, which you can do from the comfort of your own home. So if you are still a smoker, we would encourage you to quit and we are here to help support you along your path to better lung health. So with that said, this actually concludes the formal part of our presentation this evening. Um, so I'm gonna take us over and take a look at the Q and A's that have come in. Um, remember, you can still continue to submit questions here as we're starting to answer these. So let me just advance. Uh, can we advance that slide, Dr. Shea? We'll leave this up with 
your information um, as we pull up these questions here. So our first question goes back to the conversation you had around some of the bronchoscopy procedures. And mm -hmm. uh, one of our attendees was asking if there's a possibility of puncture with those. So can you talk a little bit about that as a risk and then how we would treat that? Yeah, um, the question basically pertains to is there going to be a puncture of the lung and, and caught with the cause, you know, with the result being a lung collapse with the bronchoscopy procedure. Um, yes, there is always that risk of uh, lung collapse with the bronchoscopy procedure. However, having said that, the risk is fairly low, quite low as a matter of fact. Uh, the national estimates are at about 1% actually. Uh, and for comparison, uh, if one were to, for example, get a lung biopsy through a needle through the skin, uh, what's called percutaneous lung biopsy, um, done, for example, uh, in um, those procedures where the needle goes through the skin, the uh, national um, rate of lung collapse is almost 35%. So we're talking about um, there is that risk, but it's fairly, fairly low with the bronchoscopy procedures. Here's another question that ties back to the smoking stats we just went over. Um, so the question is, how quickly can your lungs begin to heal if you stop smoking? So I know the slide indicated after two weeks, you'll have improved circulation and your lung function may increase. Do your lungs actually heal and rejuvenate themselves when you stop smoking or is there still some level of irreparable damage, if you will? The lung will, when the, when the cigarettes are no longer present and uh, causing the inflammation within the lung, the lung will immediately work to repair that, the damage done uh, by cigarette smoke. So it happens in instantly. Now, of course it happens it, because there are individual cells involved and that takes time as we mentioned in terms of the days, but even the moment that one stops smoking, that there is no longer smoke causing the um, damage to, to the lining of the lungs, the repair goes on immediately. Now for patients, for example, with conditions called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD that you hear about, those patients unfortunately have had most very often so much cigarette smoke over time that has caused permanent damage to parts of their lung. But even in those patients, quitting smoking will help salvage the remaining parts of the lung that um, have not undergone what we call ir irreversible lung damage. Here's uh, another question from the audience. What about vaping? Is it safer than cigarette smoking? That's a very common question I, that I get asked um, on a weekly basis. When, when, these elect when electronic cigarettes uh, came out a few years ago, it was, uh, there, there was a lot of fanfare around it. And it was, kind of, it was touted as basically a, a, uh, a substitute for cigarette smoking, where there's nicotines in there and it comes in different whatever have you flavors. And instead of inhaling the tar and the formaldehyde going to the lungs, that um, now people can get that, you know, the, the feel of, of smoking, but without all the, uh, all, all the bad chemicals that goes into the body. But unfortunately, as many of us, um, uh, not just the public, but in medicine, uh, realize at this time, um, is unfortunately not a uh, um, silver bullet and far from it, as a matter of fact. Vaping itself, and it really depends on a particular um, uh, particular brand, but in general, does do damage um, to lungs. And I personally have seen patients very young, the 30s or even their 20s, who come down with a condition to the lung that I would normally would not even see in someone who has smoked 40 years uh, of in 40 years of smoking. So unfortunately, 
it does do damage um, to the lungs and it can be quite dramatic at times. Yeah. So here's a question. I'm going to modify it just a little bit. So um, the, the comment is, I believe the chemicals found in our sanitizing products are just as bad as cigarette smoke, especially the forever chemicals. Um, the question is if, is if the medical community is monitoring the chemicals, which I don't think is, if that's not something that Inspira is doing, but I would wonder if you could comment on the question about the chemicals in the sanitizing product. Are, are, uh, as we inhale these things, I mean, I'm sure we're all cleaning like crazy with COVID. Um, do you see a risk of, of inhaled chemicals from some of these cleaning and sanitizing products? Yeah, you know, that, that question has been, has been debated. Um, you know, in general, in general, and, it, and a lot of it depends on the particular, you know, sanitizing um, uh, solution being used. I think the CDC has, um, um, has come out with a, you know, a list or at least a list of not approved or in a, in a, uh, an approved uh, sanitizing brands and so forth. Uh, especially those uh, um, uh, no brand ones, I would certainly be careful uh, of those. But in terms of the uh, chemicals that are in inhaled, um, you know, as long as one sticks to the generally accepted and um, by the CDC, uh, the sanitizing um, uh, treatments, in short duration, they generally will not cause uh, significant lung damage. Now, you know, they're extreme. You obviously don't want to be in the room um, for hours on end. It, uh, as indicated, for our everyday use, should not pose a um, significant risk uh, to our lung health. Thank you. Yeah. Um, here's another one that I think I'll tag team with you. I thought this is a really interesting question. Has Inspira researched the possibility of using stem cell therapy after surgery? So I can say from an institutional perspective that right now um, stem cell is happening really at, at academic and really quaternary um, facilities. But Dr. Shea, can you speak to any experience you've had either in terms of where this is appropriate, how many patients this is appropriate for, or any of the developments on that topic? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, Michelle. In terms of the basic science behind the stem cells, those tend they they those tend to occur at academic medical centers. Um, but in terms of the clinical aspects of it, uh, we are having multiple active uh, clinical trials ongoing at our leading edge cancer center. And um, while not all of them involve stem cell uh, treatment. But it's certainly something that um, will be investigated, if not now, into the in the future for sure. All right, I think we're coming up on time, but we're almost out of questions. So let's sneak in one one more here. And the question is, how does someone get pleurisy in the lungs? Yeah, that's a you know that's a great question. Pleurisy, um, basically, the definition of pleurisy is you know, inflammation or um, of the, of the, um, of the chest. There is a, actually a potential space between the edge of the lungs and the, and the chest wall or where the ribs start. That space is typically uh, nothing in there because your lungs are right up against your ribs, against your chest wall. But in, but in patients where they have an infection, for example, pneumonia, um, or even in cases of lung cancer, or if they have had radiation to the, to the chest, that space can become scarred. And that's what leads to a condition called pleurisy. Now the treatment varies very widely in terms of uh, the etiology, what, what is the reason for that? Um, for that uh, pleurisy to happen in the first place. Um, and that would basically be a discussion certainly with, your, uh, with you and your lung doctor or, or, your, um, or your surgeon about in terms of the specifics of that. All right, and with that, we are right up on time. So I would like to um, once again, thank Dr. Shea for his time tonight. Um, he is seeing patients at both our Leading Edge Cancer Center 
in Malika Hill, as well as the Frank and Edith Scarpa Regional Cancer Pavilion in Vineland. So you've got the phone number here on the screen. Um, I would also like to just say a, a huge thank you to the PR and marketing team who makes this all happen and, and supports Dr. Shea and I behind the scenes so that we're able to bring this to you. So kudos to them for a job well done. And Dr. Shea, thank you once again for your comments and your leadership in, in this realm. Um, we're thrilled to have you here with Inspira and thank you so much for your time. Have a great night. And to everyone on the line, be safe, stay well, and have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye now.